The passenger bus pulled up to the bus station and came to a sudden stop. Inside the bus, only five passengers remained and they all rushed to the exit simultaneously. Only Jennifer remained seated, observing with fascination as two elderly women engaged in a verbal dispute over a narrow passage between them. The older of the two women reproached her younger companion, saying, you could have given way, you're younger than me. The second woman quickly retorted, I might end up older than you after all. I just look young because I've always led a healthy lifestyle and never got involved with other men. Jennifer waited for the argument to end, sadly watching the women. A thought crossed her mind, how silly it is to discuss such topics at their age. With remarkable agility for her age, one of the women jumped off the bus onto the platform. Her debate partner also swiftly grabbed her overturned luggage and followed her opponent, saying, Where are you going? Wait, explain what you were implying. Do you think everyone acts like you just because you associated with many guys when you were young? Jennifer quietly slipped past the driver's cabin, but she couldn't go unnoticed. The driver was eager to express his thoughts on the matter. Young lady, they say a bad example is contagious. Try not to catch that disease. She smiled and replied, I'll do my best. The old bus doors closed with a hiss behind her, and the passenger vehicle smoothly departed from the platform. Jennifer took a deep breath of her beloved homeland's air and looked around. Two familiar silhouettes loomed ahead, and the distant shouts made it clear that the women from the bus were continuing their dispute. Jennifer turned her gaze to the sky and was struck by the beauty of the summer sunset. The sun had already dipped below the horizon, but its warm flashes still pierced through the gathering twilight. This picturesque scene changed every second. Jennifer had had a special affinity for natural phenomena since childhood, especially for watching sunrises and sunsets. In these moments, she felt inspired. Spontaneously, her brain began to rhyme words. To soar to the sky and gaze at the horizon were the raspberry sunset splashes. Sometimes I wish, but my flight melted like a light cloud once more. Jennifer wanted to add a few more lines to this lyrical masterpiece of her own creation, but a familiar voice nearby interrupted her thoughts. Jennifer, is that you? I'm walking and wondering who's standing here like a statue. Jennifer jumped in surprise, and the inspiration that had visited her for a few minutes vanished. She looked at the person who had so rudely interrupted her flow of thoughts and said with annoyance, Paula, can't you see how you scared me? The neighbor from the stairwell was not at all flustered. Girl, you nearly gave me a heart attack. You're standing alone in the middle of the street, staring at the sky. I thought maybe you'd spotted some aliens, and it was time to sound the alarm. My grandchildren tell me such scary stories about extraterrestrials that it's terrifying. Jennifer tried to smile, but it came out as more of a wry grin. I don't believe in aliens, and I wouldn't advise you to clutter your head with nonsense. Then what were you trying to see up there? I was just admiring the sunset. We have unique ones here. The neighbor seemed to be in a poetic mood too. She looked in the direction Jennifer had been gazing and dreamily said, That's true. Our area is wonderful and there's extraordinary beauty all around. Your mother and I used to love romance when we were young. We used to go to the river closer to nightfall. Sometimes just the two of us, and other times with our bows. Yes, those were the days, but all that's left are memories. Paula picked up Jennifer's travel bag. Let me help you. Come on, or you'll be standing here until morning. Jennifer tried to protest the assistance. And Paula, I can manage on my own. The bag is heavy, and it's risky for you to strain at your age. The woman gave Jennifer a disapproving look and said, What's with the hints? What age are you talking about? I'm just a little over 50. It's the best age. Jennifer burst into laughter, and Aunt Paula skeptically glanced at her again. Don't laugh. Do you think you'll always be young and beautiful? Jennifer sighed. Well, Aunt Paula, you've ruined all the romance. No worries. Sometimes it's good to come back down to earth. Consider it a rescue from imminent disaster. Getting lost in dreams is easy, but returning to reality is very difficult. Jennifer didn't respond to this philosophical statement, and Aunt Paula interpreted her silence as a sign to continue the conversation. She transferred the load to another bag and slowed her pace slightly. You know, I was so trusting in my youth, believed in everyone and everything. And because of my openness, I regret it deeply. 
Your mother probably told you about how a city slicker tricked me. No, I haven't heard anything. We don't discuss neighbors in our family. A sad shadow crossed Aunt Paula's face. It seemed Jennifer's answer disappointed her. I also have a negative attitude towards gossip. But after that incident, they made fun of me in our dear little town for a long time. I even had to go stay with relatives for a while to let things blow over. By the way, I came back with a husband, but he still left me not long after. Aunt Paula's voice tinged with bitterness, and she playfully potted Jennifer somewhere between her right shoulder blade and her shoulder. You have someone to learn from. If you follow my plan, you'll find happiness. In our little town, the chances of finding a decent husband are practically nil. Jennifer was saved from having to thank her neighbor for the practical advice by the fact that they had reached the entrance doors. Jennifer was already heading towards the staircase, but Aunt Paula stopped her. Take the bag, there's no way I'll make it up to the third floor with it. The girl took the bag and easily ascended the first flight of stairs, while Paula struggled with the climb. She was breathing heavily and grumbling. Why did I ever move into this building? Normal people waited for a house with an elevator to be built, but my mother couldn't wait to improve our living conditions. Now I have to climb this cursed staircase every day. I have a feeling that in another five years, I'll be crawling to my floor. Jennifer, without much thought, quipped, Aunt Paula, maybe losing some weight would help you. These exercises are good for your health. Try shedding some pounds, and you'll feel relief right away. This advice from the young girl stirred a wave of indignation in the woman. You're still too young to be handing out advice. Let your mother lose weight. As for me, I'm just fine. Aunt Paula's fiery speech drained the last of her energy. With great effort, she conquered the final steps and shuffled with her steps towards her apartment. Jennifer, being polite, bid farewell to her neighbor. Goodbye, Aunt Paula, and thank you for your help. Come over for tea later. I brought various treats. The woman mumbled something unintelligible and slammed the door. Jennifer reached for the doorbell, but her mother's voice came from behind the door. Don't ring it. I'm opening it already. Elizabeth emerged onto the landing and hugged her daughter. Jennifer, I'm glad you came. Your dad is sick. He's been in bed for two days now. He's got a fever and a cough, acting as capricious as a child. Come on in, just be quiet. He's just fallen asleep, and I don't want to wake him. The young woman followed her mother into the apartment. Elizabeth gestured for her to go to the kitchen. After securely closing the door behind her, she whispered, your dad wanted tomato soup, so I'm trying to please him. Jennifer looked around and noticed all the necessary ingredients. She asked with surprise, Mom, why all the extra effort when you can just buy ready-made soup from the store? Elizabeth glanced at the door. Did you forget that your dad only likes homemade food? And now he's become unbearable. Sick people are always dissatisfied with something. Remember when I was little? I used to annoy you too. How could I forget? Any mother keeps every day of her child's life in her memory. I used to write it all down in a notebook when your teeth first appeared, when you took your first steps. Jennifer kissed her mother gently. Yes, I remember that diary. You used to show it to me. Pleasant memories put both women in a nostalgic mood. Mom, I'm so happy to have you both. Jennifer said with a smile. Elizabeth gently pulled her daughter aside. Don't distract me. Help me with the cooking. Change quietly so as not to wake your father. Jennifer changed her clothes and contemplated how to tell her mother about her upcoming marriage, but Elizabeth beat her to the punch. Jennifer, you can't hide your thoughts. Your face gives everything away, and from your blissful expression and sparkling eyes, it's not hard to guess that something significant has happened, something. Yes, Mom, something important has happened in my life. It seems I'm getting married. The dreamy atmosphere in the kitchen was shattered by a deep voice echoing from the depths of the apartment. Woody swung the kitchen door open and first looked at his wife incredulously, and then at his daughter. Jennifer was about to rush into her father's arms, but he preemptively extended his hands. Dowling, stay where you are. We don't know what infection has taken hold of me. It might be a dangerous one. My fever has been going on for two days, and the pills aren't helping. Jennifer stepped back. The pause that followed, against the backdrop of joyful emotions, created an awkward atmosphere. Elizabeth looked at her husband with disapproval. Woody, you're an amazing person. You always ruin everything. 
Our daughter hasn't been home for several months, and now that she's here, she receives such a cold welcome. Woody not only possessed a booming voice, but also a robust physique. So his movements in confined spaces could lead to a catastrophe. After his wife's reproach, he turned abruptly toward his daughter and embraced her, seeking to rectify his mistake. The soup in the pot was rapidly rising, and Woody picked up a spoon from the table. He confidently headed for the stove, but his wife blocked his path. Woody, it's better if you don't. Your interference might deprive us all of dinner. The head of the family obediently handed the utensil to his wife. I was just trying to help. I see I'm superfluous here. Elizabeth, I'm upset with you, so I'm going to bed. I'll continue to suffer in silence. Please don't disturb me unless it's absolutely necessary. Woody intended to leave, but Elizabeth casually added, you didn't even ask our daughter how she's doing. Just so you know, she's planning to get married. Woody froze in amazement. He looked at his wife first and then at Jennifer. Is this some kind of prank? Jennifer leaned towards her father, forgetting her caution. No, dad, it's true. I'll spill all my secrets to you, but only after dinner, okay? Woody remained in a state of astonishment. Sweetheart, you certainly surprised your mother and me. I knew that this would happen someday, but I didn't think it would happen so soon. Dad, have you forgotten that I'm already 25? Jennifer replied with a grin. Woody became agitated and started massaging his temples vigorously. Elizabeth looked at her husband with concern and asked, Woody, are you feeling unwell again? There's no need to get so worked up over trifles. Go lie down and I'll bring you some medicine. Elizabeth, our daughter is getting married and you call it a trifle. Woody's shoulders slumped and he headed towards the couch where Elizabeth had set up a makeshift daytime sick room. Jennifer observed her parents, feeling a warm wave of gratitude towards the people who had given her life. She knew they loved her very much, but she hadn't expected her father to be so deeply affected upon learning about her impending marriage. Ever since Jennifer could remember, Woody had been the epitome of reliability and integrity for her. She absorbed every word he said and tried to emulate him in every way. The little girl's greatest source of pride was the fact that Woody worked at the local bakery. Every day, he would wake up at 5 in the morning and have a quick breakfast. Once, the young daughter asked, Daddy, why does your work start so early? Everyone else is still asleep, and you're already working. He replied with an important look, I have a crucial task. I need to make sure that fresh loaves of bread are delivered to all the stores. The people in our town wake up, go to the store, and find fresh bread from the oven waiting for them on the shelves. In the little girl's imagination, it was hard to fathom how one oven could bake enough bread for everyone. But Woody had an answer for any complex question and made an effort to explain the baking process in a way the young child could understand. At our factory, Jennifer, we have enormous ovens, and they are controlled by people. So, they're like machines. You got it right. Yes, they're like machines, and we can adjust the temperature, time, and other parameters. Woody enthusiastically described how they retrieved the bread rolls and loaded them onto a truck. Jennifer watched her father with eyes full of admiration and genuine childlike wonder. His story left a profound impression on her young and impressionable mind. Daddy. Does it always smell delicious at your factory? Woody was surprised that his daughter was concerned about this aspect of the process, but he answered her question. In the bakery where they bake the bread and rolls, there's always a distinct aroma, and the people working there also smell like bread, but there are downsides to that job. It's constantly hot. That's why they only hire healthy people for that department. Jennifer didn't take long to think before declaring, Dad, when I grow up, I want to bake bread too. In her young age, Jennifer's dreams changed almost daily. One day, she was interested in becoming a baker, and the next morning, she dreamed of growing beautiful plants like her mother. Elizabeth, too, vividly described her job to her daughter. Elizabeth had pursued her dream throughout her life, but when it finally became a reality, she often regretted the chosen path. It wasn't the work itself that disappointed her but rather the conditions in which her team had to labor. The company's CEO constantly criticized the small team. Nothing but losses from you. Today, everyone is switching to self-accounting and soon will have to adapt to market conditions as well. I can't even imagine where to put you all. 
the CEO had a strong character and his own vision of the future. He relentlessly imposed it on others. Josh had long dreamed of getting rid of the freeloaders, and the landscapers were at the forefront of this category of workers. Josh had tried numerous times to shake off this burden, arguing that it would be simpler and cheaper to use temporary specialists. However, the city administration vehemently opposed such an initiative. The mayor himself had once advised the ambitious bureaucrat, Josh, you have real professionals working for you. You should value your team, but you want to lay them off for questionable savings. Thanks to the work of the landscapers, our city looks clean and cozy. Sit down with your team. Think about how you can improve efficiency with your own resources. Josh had already opened his mouth to comment on the team when the mayor raised a cautionary hand. I don't want to limit you, but I believe a month should be enough for you to address this issue. I mean developing a specific plan that you'll present to me before the next meeting. Josh nodded deferentially to the mayor. He couldn't and didn't have the right to object to the city's leader. So, after letting off steam during a boxing session, he decided to take it out on his team. Since the landscapers were the main irritants for him, upon returning to his office, he confronted Elizabeth, who headed a small division. In a brusque manner, he ordered his subordinates, I want to see a detailed plan on this desk in two weeks, with no room for imagination. Do I make myself clear? Elizabeth didn't even flinch under the boss's pressure and calmly replied, I understand you, Josh. She didn't remind Josh that she had submitted various projects for his consideration several times, projects that would have allowed the company to turn a profit upon implementation. However, practically every option required expanding production capacities and, consequently, additional financial investments. Therefore, Josh had ruthlessly rejected all of her initiatives. Elizabeth, do you want to bankrupt us altogether? Do you have any idea how much money you'd have to waste to build your greenhouses? And where's the guarantee that people will buy your flowers? Elizabeth tried to convince her boss that the costs would quickly pay off. Josh, this is a common practice. Today, many municipal services make a decent profit precisely through landscape design. I consulted with specialists in the field, and they promised to help with the organization. The boss rudely interrupted the woman. Elizabeth, I'm warning you for the last time. Don't do it. Back then, that common saying sounded like a threat, and Elizabeth was very afraid of losing her job. To emphasize his point, the boss added in the same threatening tone. Elizabeth, I've heard rumors that you've been complaining to various authorities. Bear in mind, I won't tolerate that, regardless of your seniority and commendations. After such a warning from her boss, Elizabeth remained silent for a long time and refrained from any unnecessary activity. She hid her projects in her desk drawer. She was surprised when her boss, upon returning from the mayor's office, said, Elizabeth, I remember you had some innovations in mind. Bring me that plan to have a look. She didn't ask any unnecessary questions and brought a folder with her original projects to the boss's office. Surprisingly, Josh thanked her and even attempted to apologize for the offense he had caused earlier. Elizabeth, don't hold it against me. You understand what it's like to be in a managerial position. I understand, Josh. I don't hold anything against you. Well, that's good. The boss brightened up. The mayor summoned me. He's a very demanding man. He wants all our enterprises to be self-sustaining. So, we'll have to step up our game. Perhaps it's your time to shine, Elizabeth, and your ideas will come in handy. Elizabeth was not an ambitious person, and soon she forgot about her conversation with her boss. But in the last days of August, the entire team was urgently gathered in the assembly hall. Josh stood on a small stage, radiating happiness. Next to him was an attractive lady in an expensive suit. The boss began his speech solemnly. Dear colleagues, I won't abuse your attention and we'll get straight to the main news. Starting tomorrow, Amanda will be heading our enterprise. So, please welcome her. The woman introduced by the boss nodded slightly, perhaps expecting applause like an actress, but the small hall remained silent. Elizabeth observed this individual with interest and mentally guessed that she was roughly her age. Josh was impatiently shuffling his feet next to her, and his satisfied expression hinted at his intention to continue his speech. Like an experienced orator, he sensed a favorable moment and moved on to the main item on the agenda. 
Amanda is not yet familiar with our affairs. So I dare say that our partial reorganization plan has been approved not only by the city administration, but also by the governor. At this point, Josh deliberately paused and infused a hint of sadness into his voice. Unfortunately, I won't be able to participate in this fascinating process personally since I'm being transferred to another position, but I promise to closely follow the implementation of this grand plan, born within these walls. Elizabeth listened to her boss's lengthy speech, captivated. She didn't immediately understand which plan Josh was referring to. However, Willow, who was sitting nearby, whispered, Elizabeth, don't you realize that our Josh is talking about your project? It's thanks to you that he got promoted, but he didn't even mention your name. Elizabeth hadn't fully processed this news when the new boss took the floor. Amanda spoke clearly and to the point. She thanked the team for their warm welcome and promised to get to know each employee individually. The next morning, Amanda invited the heads of all departments to her office. Once again, she spoke concisely and directly. I've reviewed your personal records briefly, not out of curiosity, but to have a riff idea about each of you. Now, a few words about myself. The attendees exchanged puzzled glances, and the boss smiled, noticing their confusion. Unconventional start, isn't it? Well, I prefer creative solutions. You see, I'm a progressive person by nature, so I gladly break old stereotypes. I believe that in any work environment, everyone should have equal rights. But let's not forget about responsibilities. They vary depending on the position held. Almost simultaneously, the meeting participants uttered the sacramental phrase, well, there you go. This brief phrase resonated through the office, hitting the wall and hanging in the air. The new leader endured both the rumble of discontent and the subsequent pause. Then, she almost cheerfully continued, I'd like to touch on responsibilities a bit and remind you that discipline is paramount. All troubles start with a violation of production regulations. So, I'll ask all of you to conduct relevant work in your teams. I don't want to scare anyone, but those who don't fit into the work routine will be let go. That's all. Please disperse to your workplaces. Everyone headed for the exit, and Elizabeth was among the last to leave. Unexpectedly, Amanda asked her to stay for a moment. Amanda confessed that she hadn't wanted to come here initially, but when she saw the beauty of the place, she fell in love with this oasis of tranquility. From reliable sources, she had learned that Elizabeth's brigade had contributed to this beauty. At the end of their conversation, Amanda added, I hope we can work together effectively. And as for your project, Elizabeth, surprised, asked, how did you know it was mine? Amanda smiled and replied, my secretary briefed me on it yesterday. On her way home, Elizabeth walked with such speed that it seemed she had grown wings on her back. For the first time in many years, she returned from work in such a good mood. Of course, these changes didn't escape Woody's perceptive gaze. Elizabeth, you look like you just won an Oscar. Elizabeth waved it off. No, then why are you glowing? Elizabeth quickly got busy with household chores and prepared dinner for the family. After Woody's last question, she sat down at the table and exhaled, as if preparing for a plunge into water. I've never told you much about my work, but today I'll share. Woody, we got a new boss. Josh got promoted. Today, I had a conversation with the new boss. I can't make up my mind yet. They say first impressions can be deceiving, but I think she's a good person. Engrossed in their conversation, the parents didn't notice Jennifer sneaking into the kitchen. When her mother took a pause, the girl chimed in. We have a new girl in our class too. And something tells me this girl is the daughter of your boss. Her name is Natalie Miller. Elizabeth turned her gaze to her daughter and said perplexedly, you're probably right. Our boss has the same last name, Miller. She's a very pleasant woman. Jennifer made a face. Mom, maybe your boss is nice, but her daughter isn't. Ladies, let's have dinner first, and then you can chat away in private. The female members of the family had to obey, but during dinner, the daughter and mother exchanged meaningful glances. Satisfied with dinner, Woody comfortably settled on his favorite couch. But the next day, he regretted not being present during the discussion of the newcomers. As usual, he arrived at work around 6 and supervised the loading of bread products. One familiar co-worker confided in him. Woody, there's something big happening here. 
Have you heard that our director is being removed from his position? Woody indifferently replied, No, I haven't heard. All of that is just gossip. Why would they remove him? The woman persisted, I'm sure about it. My neighbor works as a janitor at the prosecutor's office, and she heard that a criminal case has been opened against our director. She strained to recall the wording of the criminal code article, but then waved her hand, saying, I understand what these machinations are about. Another worker who had finished loading confirmed this version, saying, Woody, you're out of the loop. The whole town already knows about this. They say a new director is coming any day now. The new director rolled up to the entrance in a luxurious foreign car. He himself looked respectable but behaved as if he were the head of a separate state. The bread factory employees exchanged opinions in hushed tones. Woody kept his thoughts to himself, only expressing surprise when he learned that the new director's last name was Miller. Over dinner, he shared this news with his family. Girls, guess what? We also have new management, and believe it or not, the new director's last name is Miller. I wonder where this cheerful family came from and what remarkable achievements this trio made to have two top managers replaced for them. Jennifer smirked mysteriously. You guys are so behind. You don't know anything, okay? I'll satisfy your curiosity. The entire family came from Switzerland. Natalie's parents used to work there, but they had to return to their homeland. Woody couldn't hide his surprise. Well, such details. Who told you all this? Natalie is actually a nice girl. She even invited us over. But later, when they settle into their new apartment, Jennifer closed her eyes and dreamily said, Mom, Dad, can you imagine? They were offered a free apartment in an old building, but they refused and bought a place in a new high rise. They have plenty of money and each of them has their own car. Elizabeth gave her daughter a little Ted. Jennifer, watch your language. The girl grumbled in dissatisfaction. I don't think I said anything bad. Jennifer dramatically turned around and left the kitchen. The spouses exchanged silent glances. Their daughter had never made such remarks before. It was the first time she had spoken to them in such a disrespectful and provocative tone, but it was a shock they would soon forget by evening. Natalie stormed into Jennifer's life like a whirlwind. She completely transformed the perspective of the modest girl who had a reputation for being an excellent student. Elizabeth and Woody grew concerned about their daughter because she, who had always been calm and balanced, began to frequently display disobedience. However, it wasn't just their daughter's character that changed. Natalie's influence was noticeable in everything. Interests, fashion choices, and relationships with classmates. Jennifer even started talking to her parents as if they were equals. One day, she decided to drastically change her appearance without even consulting her mother. When Jennifer returned home after an outing, Elizabeth didn't immediately recognize her daughter. The girl's face was adorned with makeup, and her hair stood up in spikes. The woman was taken aback. Jennifer, what have you done to yourself? Her daughter had a defiant attitude. Nothing special. I just changed my image a bit. I want to look normal. Elizabeth didn't bother listening to her daughter. She firmly made Jennifer wash off everything from her face. Do you think this is normal? Heaven forbid your father sees you like this. Do you know who you look like? Jennifer sniffled. I don't know. I'm even ashamed to say it. You're only 14. It's scary to think about what you'll do tomorrow. Jennifer squirmed trying to break free from her mother's grip. But Elizabeth paid no attention to her indignant outbursts. She washed the makeup from her daughter's face, saying, Jennifer, you've decided to become independent too early. As long as your father and I are alive, we won't allow you to do this. After finishing with the cleansing rituals, Elizabeth handed her daughter a towel. Here, dry yourself off and pray to God that your father doesn't see you. For about 10 minutes, Jennifer sobbed in the bathroom. She felt humiliated and longed to grow up quickly. Her emotions overflowed, and she muttered in angry frustration. It's okay. Just three more years to endure. I'll finish school, and then I'll move far away. No one will tell me what to wear or who to be friends with. Expressing her dissatisfaction out loud, the girl calmed down a bit but didn't want to come out of her hiding place. She was waiting for her mom to come and call her to the table. However, Elizabeth was busy in the kitchen and seemed to have forgotten that she had a daughter. 
After spending about an hour in the bathroom, Jennifer voluntarily ended her self-imposed confinement. Her mother shot her a fleeting glance. We're going to have dinner now. Get some bread and call your father. Elizabeth spoke in an even tone, which surprised Jennifer. She had expected more of a confrontation, but there were no hints of her wrongdoing. This puzzled her greatly, but she didn't want to invite trouble, so she pretended that nothing had happened. Dinner proceeded in the usual atmosphere. Only her father unexpectedly asked, Jennifer, how are things going at school? Everything's fine with me. Dad, why are you suddenly asking about my school stuff? Woody stared at his daughter. Rumors reached me that you were struggling in some subjects. I don't want to accuse anyone without a basis because I believe that a person should be responsible for their own actions. But only a strong person can do that, and I don't respect those who are weak. Jennifer felt an uncomfortable lump in her throat. She was afraid to meet her father's gaze. Dad, who do you consider weak? Primarily, those who easily succumb to someone else's influence. A person is given a brain to think. Living by someone else's mind means not respecting oneself. Elizabeth didn't interfere in the serious conversation, but by the expression on her daughter's face, she understood that Woody's words had hit home. After that significant talk with her father, Jennifer didn't come home in a shocking appearance anymore. Many years later, she would fondly remember the first adult lesson her parents had given her. Following the conversation with her father, she didn't sever ties with her new friend, but she was honest with her. Heart-to-heart -heart conversations took place after school when the girls were on their way home. Natalie was the first to ask, Jennifer, you don't seem like yourself today. On the contrary, Today I return to my usual state, all thanks to my parents. Even so, uh, if I understood you correctly, you think I'm a bad influence on you. Jennifer paused. Natalie, let's sit down. You didn't quite get me right. The girls found a free bench, and Natalie challenged her. Go on, I'm listening carefully. Jennifer took a deep breath and laid it all out. Natalie, you're a cool girl, and I really enjoy your company, but my parents' opinion matters to me too and I think they are right in believing that a person should determine for themselves what is good and what is bad. So, I am to blame after all for you changing your appearance based on my advice. No, I'm to blame for that because I gave in to your influence. One should use their own judgment, as my dad says. Sure, go ahead. Live as your daddy advises you to. I don't impose myself on anyone. Besides, I can't stand boring people, and you're as boring as a gray mouse. While the crude comparison to a rodent had unsettled Jennifer, she decided not to respond to her friend's outburst. Both girls felt that continuing the conversation was pointless. They silently went their separate ways without saying goodbye. For several days, Natalie ignored Jennifer at school. She even managed to find a new influence, hoping that this action would stir up jealousy in her defiant friend. But Jennifer, on the contrary, felt relief. One day, her mother asked, you're not friends with Natalie anymore. Her daughter responded lethargically, not anymore. We have different ideas about right and wrong. So, a difference in opinion. It seems that way. It's a shame. She's not a bad girl, just a bit wayward. Jennifer didn't inquire further with her mother about why she regretted the end of her daughter's relationship with her boss's daughter. Throughout the evening, she pondered this, and she even suspected that Elizabeth was concerned it might affect her job. However, time passed, and there were no consequences for either her father or her mother. Autumn silently slipped away, followed by winter. The children were eagerly anticipating the holidays. Jennifer also had plans for this period. She had been passionate about history for a long time and wanted to dedicate her vacation to studying the Middle Ages. Their neighbor, Aunt Paula, worked at the Central Library and had promised to find books on the subject for her. Lost in these thoughts, the girl hurried to school, but a piercing scream made her forget her plans. Someone nearby was shouting, Oh, help anyone, please. The words were mixed with crying, but Jennifer immediately recognized the voice of her former friend. She rushed towards the cries but stopped dead in her tracks. On the icy road leading to the school's entrance lay Natalie, writhing in pain. A stranger was already attending to her. Hang in there, dear. I'm calling an ambulance. How did you manage to fall so unluckily? Natalie replied angrily through her tears. 
It's just that in this miserable little town, no one cares about anything. The ice is terrible, and the utility workers are lazy. They should have spread some sand. I'm taking them to court over this. Jennifer impulsively moved towards the injured girl, but almost slipped herself. Meanwhile, the stranger was on the phone with the hospital. What's your name, dear? Natalie answered spitefully. I'm Natalie Miller. My dad is the director of the bread factory. I'll tell him everything, and he'll straighten things out in your town for sure. In the heat of the moment, Natalie forgot about her injured leg and made an imprudent movement. She immediately screamed in pain. Oh, I can't take it anymore. I'll die right here from the pain, and then my dad will definitely lock your mom up. Jennifer squatted down next to the injured girl and softly reminded her, Natalie, don't scream and think about what you're saying. After all, the director of the utility company is your mother. Are you trying to send her to jail? Natalie opened her mouth in surprise. She hadn't had time to collect her thoughts because, at that moment, an ambulance arrived at the scene. The paramedics swiftly lifted Natalie to her feet, and she hopped on one leg, crying loudly. What's going to happen to me now? Will I be crippled? One of the medics scolded her. Young lady, stop the hysterics. We'll take you to the trauma center, where they'll take an x-ray, and then a kind doctor will put a cast on it. Natalie started to cry. She looked around, and upon seeing Jennifer, she pleaded. Jennifer, please call my mom and tell her something happened to me. Jennifer decisively jumped into the car. I'll go with you, and we'll call your mom from there. While the medics provided Natalie with the necessary medical care, Jennifer waited in the reception area. Soon, Natalie's mother arrived at the hospital. Despite the unique circumstances of their first meeting, Jennifer observed her mother's boss, Amanda, with interest. Amanda noticed her attentive gaze. Perhaps you were expecting to see an evil aunt, she joked. Jennifer felt embarrassed by her own tactlessness. No, my mom has always spoken highly of you, and always in a positive light. It's just that Natalie doesn't resemble you at all. She's prickly, like a hedgehog, while you are calm and beautiful. Amanda smiled. Thank you for the kind words and for your help. Tell me, how did all this happen? I didn't actually see how it happened. I heard the screams and rushed to help. But a stranger got there before me. She called the ambulance. Unexpectedly, Amanda began talking to Jennifer as if they were old acquaintances. And what should we do with this girl? I can't figure her out. I've warned Natalie so many times to wear proper footwear for the season, but it goes in one ear and out the other. She just had to show off. You know, Jennifer, when we lived in Switzerland, Natalie was always the center of attention. She thought everyone here would bow down to her too. The door to the procedure room swung open, and a nurse yelled, Get your beauty out of here. Her cries are giving the doctor and me a headache. Jennifer and Natalie's mother rushed into the room together. With their combined efforts, they lifted the injured girl from the examination table and headed to Amanda's car in the parking lot. Sensing attention being directed towards her, Natalie began to whine even louder. Mommy, how am I going to walk now? It's nothing serious. We'll buy you crutches tomorrow. You are talking about it so calmly. Imagine what they'll say at school when they see me with those sticks. Amanda, still maintaining her calm demeanor, replied, School will have to be forgotten for the time being. Until the cast is removed, you'll be sitting at home watching TV. You've arranged quite a fun vacation for yourself, so there's no one else to blame. Jennifer desperately wanted to comfort her friend. Don't cry. If you want, I'll come to visit you. Natalie stared at Jennifer, her eyes filled with hope. I really want that. I'm all alone, and it's going to be so boring. Jennifer, come over anytime. Even better, if your parents would let you stay with us while I'm recovering. At first, Jennifer thought this request was outlandish, and she was even afraid to mention it to her parents. However, in the evening, Amanda herself called and asked to speak to Jennifer's mother. Elizabeth spoke on the phone for about five minutes before returning the phone to her daughter. Why didn't you tell me right away that something had happened to Natalie? I just didn't have a chance. Everything happened so suddenly. Natalie's mom asked if we could let you go to her. What do you think? I'm not sure. I'll have to ask my dad. To Woody's surprise, he took Amanda's unexpected request calmly. Friends show themselves in times of trouble. With your friend, it might not be a disaster, but it's a big inconvenience. Now she'll have to stay home for a few weeks, 
which means she won't be able to attend school and will miss out on spending time with her friends. Woody wanted to say more, but Jennifer interrupted him. Dad, I understand. You're such a kind person. He smiled. Kindness, my dear, always triumphs. That's why people lean toward goodness. Even troublemakers can't resist the power of kindness. The next day, Jennifer packed her belongings and headed to the Miller residence. Natalie was genuinely delighted to see her. Jennifer, you're a real friend. You won't believe how much better I feel now. We're going to have an amazing Christmas together. In fact, from this day on, we won't be apart. Natalie's wishes came true in almost every way. The two friends indeed had a blast at the holiday celebration organized by Natalie's parents. They were practically inseparable until the end of their school years, but then their paths diverged for a long time. Natalie went to study in Switzerland, where she still had many friends. Jennifer pursued a career in art history and enrolled in the regional university. For five long years, Natalie didn't keep in touch. Her parents had also left soon after Natalie's departure. Woody broke the news to his daughter. Our bosses have moved to Germany. They have an apartment there, and they were offered a promising job. It's the right move. What's left for us here? Jennifer, while you're still studying, don't even think about coming back here. Find your place under the sun somewhere else. Jennifer had been accustomed to taking her father's words as guidance from childhood. When she was in her final year of university, she was offered a position as an art historian at a clothing museum, which she gladly accepted. She couldn't wait to finish her studies, and her vivid imagination painted the brightest future. She particularly daydreamed about her hometown, where she could occasionally visit for a few days. Jennifer reminisced about the happy years of her youth, the breathtaking sunsets and sunrises. As she admired the captivating natural phenomena, she envisioned defending her dissertation. She also yearned to join a group of archaeologists on an excavation of some long-lost city. Jennifer dreamed of many things but have completely forgotten about her personal happiness. During her student years and beyond, she didn't engage in serious relationships with guys, even though many young men attempted to court her. Jennifer believed that her time for happiness hadn't come yet, and she wasn't interested in short-lived romances. But days turned into weeks, and many of her classmates got married while her personal life remained stagnant. It's uncertain how long this period of uncertainty would have continued if Natalie hadn't reappeared in her life. After a five-year hiatus, Natalie unexpectedly called her. For about 10 minutes, Natalie showered Jennifer with enthusiastic greetings before finally telling her own story. Jennifer, life here is bustling, and I'm right in the middle of it. Can you imagine? Jennifer, try as she might couldn't envision this vivid picture that Natalie was painting. And Natalie continued to share her latest news. Sorry for not showing up on your radar for so long. You know how it is, with studies and everything. You probably don't even guess why I'm calling you. Jennifer took a wild guess. Maybe you're getting married. Natalie squealed with delight. Oh yes, you got it. And who's your chosen one? A fellow student or someone from the old acquaintances? Jennifer. I don't settle for small things. Young boys need to gain experience. They don't know how to make a living. That's why I prefer mature men. My Stanley is a fantastic person, a real superman. Natalie, are your parents even aware? A significant sigh could be heard. Oh, you can't imagine the scandal. My father was beside himself because Stanley is almost his age, and my dad was raised with old-fashioned traditions. Natalie. Maybe you shouldn't rush into marriage. No, I've already made up my mind. Don't forget to invite me to the wedding. Although I doubt I'll be able to come to Switzerland. Natalie burst into laughter. Jennifer, what wedding? It's different here. We don't have big celebrations. In short, the wedding is canceled, but I think we'll see each other very soon. Jennifer had long grown accustomed to the fact that Natalie's promises often turned out to be empty words so she didn't attach much importance to her friend's promise of a soon-to-come meeting. However, it didn't take a month for her friend to remind her of her existence. This time, Natalie woke Jennifer up in the middle of the night. Friend, come to Germany. Stanley and I just popped in to visit my parents for a few days. My husband has been wanting to go there for a while, but we never had the time. Jennifer found herself in a tricky situation. 
She had only worked at the museum for a year, and she had just returned from her vacation a week ago, so she didn't expect they would grant her even two days off. Consequently, she responded to her friend without much enthusiasm. Natalie, you should have warned me about your visit earlier, and then I could have figured something out. But now, I can't promise anything because I just got back from vacation. Her friend snorted over the phone. Work, work. It makes me so sad when I hear that cumbersome word. Fortunately, it's not a concern for me because my husband provides for me entirely. But I don't have such a guarantee. I have to earn a living myself. That's my oversight. I need to take care of you a bit. Once I recover, I'll take on this responsible task. Natalie, there's no need to strain yourself. I'm perfectly capable of finding a life partner on my own. And about our upcoming meeting, I can't say anything specific, but I'll try to get some time off. Jennifer had to request three days off. She had been to Germany several times during her studies. Natalie's parents lived in a relatively new neighborhood, so she had to rely on taxi services. She called Natalie in advance. Get ready, I'm on my way. At the entrance to the high-rise building, Natalie and her husband were waiting for their guest. Miller went out of her way to demonstrate her refinement to her friend. Jennifer, meet my husband, Stanley. The young woman extended her hand to Stanley, and he weakly shook it. Jennifer didn't like Natalie's husband from the very first glance. Despite his quite pleasant appearance, there was something about him that repelled her. Dinner passed in a tense atmosphere, with only Natalie laughing without reason. There was only one positive aspect to this meeting Stanley spoke English fluently. Early in the meal, Natalie proudly announced, My husband travels the world a lot, so he's fluent in several languages. I plan to catch up and soon, Stanley will take me with him on his journeys. Isn't that right, honey? It's not customary for us to mix business with personal matters. So, Natalie, joint trips are out of the question, but I can arrange a vacation for you anytime. My mom loves to travel, she'd be happy to accompany you. But we have a completely different view of marriage, and I also believe that spouses shouldn't hinder each other. Amanda couldn't hold back. Then it's unclear why get married at all if you're going to live with your husband like a neighbor. A serene smile appeared on the son-in-law's face. Why get married? To continue the family line. Is a neighbor not suitable for this mission? Natalie and I are planning to have many children. Jennifer saw how her friend nudged her husband, but he didn't react and continued to talk about the prospects of married life. Natalie blinked her eyes in bewilderment and looked very pitiful. Natalie's father was the first to leave the table. Sorry, dear guests, but it's time for me to go. Enjoy yourselves. Don't worry about us. Following Jeffrey's example, Natalie's mother left a minute later. You young folks, just stay here and chat. I'll be gone for a bit. Sorry, but I have some urgent matters. Jennifer found herself in a difficult situation. She also wanted to leave this house as soon as possible, but she felt sorry for Natalie. To alleviate the awkwardness that had arisen, she suggested, how about taking a walk for a bit? The newlyweds welcomed the suggestion. The three of them strolled along the waterfront until late in the evening. Jennifer shared interesting historical facts related to the landmarks they encountered on their way. Stanley occasionally exclaimed with enthusiasm, while Natalie remained silent. Jennifer had already studied the train schedules and hurried to the train station. Natalie, thanks for the wonderful evening, but it's time for me to go. Friend, you've just come alive, but I thought you'd spend the night with us. I would love to, but I only got a day off. Natalie looked disappointed. That's a shame. I thought we'd have a good chat. Well, if that's the case, let me at least see you off to the train station. Jennifer didn't get a chance to give a positive response because Stanley beat her to it. He showed his wife the time on his watch and tapped the dial with his finger. Natalie, it's already too late. It's time to sleep. Her friend averted her gaze. I'm sorry. Stanley is strict about his schedule. He does everything by the clock. While the two young women chatted, the man hailed a taxi. Natalie, it's time for us to go to the hotel. Natalie smiled apologetically. I'm sorry, my friend. I'll call you later. Jennifer couldn't move for a long time. She had imagined a reunion with her best friend after years of separation quite differently. But what surprised her the most was the fact that the newlyweds were staying in a hotel. Natalie had also quickly become tired of Stanley's strict routine. 
just like he was. She confided this to her friend during one of their phone conversations. Even from a great distance, Jennifer could sense that her friend was on the brink of a breakdown. Natalie spoke incoherently and sighed often. Jennifer, only now have I realized that I was blinded by love. Stanley seemed so dependable and warm to me. I tried not to notice his little flaws, but it took just a year for me to understand that my husband is a miser and a tightwad. Jennifer corrected her friend, Natalie, that's the same thing. What? Well, miser and tightwad are synonyms. Her friend screamed so loudly into the phone that Jennifer was worried about the state of her hearing. Jennifer, I'm already feeling terrible and you're making jokes. I hope to find support and understanding from you. You have no idea what I've been through this past year. You wouldn't believe it, but he even controlled my purchases of underwear. And heaven forbid if I chose something expensive and branded. Stanley could publicly humiliate me. Jennifer rushed to reassure her friend, Natalie. You can always count on me. And right now, I fully support you. If you've decided to leave your boyfriend, then hurry up. I already did. I left him while he was away. But as mommy made sure I didn't take anything extra. Imagine, she even checked my bags at the exit. No, Natalie. I can't imagine that. What do you plan to do next? I'll continue my search. What? Maybe you should take a break. It won't work. I've already found myself a boyfriend. His name is Donald. He's young. His parents work at the embassy. Before Jennifer could even congratulate her friend, she learned that Donald turned out to be a total jerk. Soon, tired of such adventures, Natalie returned to her parents. But she didn't mourn for long and one day told her friend about her new, amazing love. Jennifer, he's absolutely fantastic. By the way, he's something like you, either a historian or an art historian. In short, something from that field. I can't wait for you two to meet. It's very interesting to see what you think of him. Jennifer tried to cool her friend's enthusiasm. Natalie, I'm swamped right now. I don't even have time to catch my breath. We just received a new exhibition and I have to plan everything. But you can surely take one day off. After all, take sick leave if you have to, just for this occasion. Jennifer gave in to her friend once again. With great effort, she managed to get just one day off. But at that moment, she had no idea that this very day would determine her entire future. Natalie was waiting for her at the train station, and after the traditional huds, she pulled Jennifer along. Let's hurry. Leonard is waiting there. You've arrived at the perfect time because they're having a party today. There will be many celebrities. Natalie spoke at lightning speed, and Jennifer couldn't get a word in. It wasn't until they were in Leonard's car that Miller finally paused. But before that, she introduced her companion. Leonard, meet the unique girl I've told you so much about. The young man with an epic ponytail on the back of his head turned around and gave Jennifer a look. There was no verbal exchange, and silence filled the car. They drove for about 40 minutes, and a vague unease overcame Jennifer. Leonard turned around again. Don't worry, we'll be there soon. Just a little longer. Unexpectedly, Natalie chimed in. Jennifer, have you heard of Legoland? It's an amazing theme park. The beauty there is breathtaking. Sounds great. I've only seen it in photos. Well, now you'll see it in person. Not long ago, it was just ruins there. But now they've opened something like a museum. Leonard's new house is nearby, and he invited us. They arrived at a charming two-story building with a neat lawn in front of it. The host, a man in his 40s, greeted them at the gate. We've been waiting for you. Leonard replied, traffic, we barely made it out of the city. The host chided him, why don't you introduce me to your charming companion? Leonard was puzzled as he didn't understand who was being referred to, but the host clarified the situation himself. He approached Jennifer, who are you, dear stranger? Leonard, did you notice that this charming girl is incredibly similar to the girl in Botticelli's The Birth of Venus? Natalie widened her eyes as she wasn't familiar with medieval art. Leonard, too, didn't exhibit any speed of thought. Unexpectedly, Jennifer herself responded, It's the first time I've heard of such a resemblance, but thank you anyway. The host looked at the guest with interest. I see you have a good understanding of art. Jennifer replied without a hint of arrogance. Yes, I'm an art historian. Currently, I work at a fashion museum. The host became even more delighted. I didn't expect such a surprise. 
It turns out we're colleagues, although I'm often invited as an expert. Oh, why am I keeping our esteemed guests by the gate? Come, I'll introduce you to the others. Throughout the evening, Sam, as the host was called, didn't leave Jennifer's side. The young woman was flattered by the attention of this charming man. Holding her breath, she listened to his stories about incredible discoveries he had made during his work. Jennifer, you won't believe it, but in the early days after university, I worked in customs. Yes, indeed, I had to inspect every canvas leaving our country. And did you manage to prevent any crimes? If you mean illegal exports, then we thwarted such attempts almost every day. It was a fascinating job, but I had to leave it. For a moment, the man became melancholic, and Jennifer sensed that his change in mood was related to something personal. Being a polite person, she pretended not to notice it. The wonderful evening flew by unnoticed, and Jennifer really didn't want to leave Sam's house. However, she only had one day at her disposal, and she had to hurry to the train station. She began searching for her friend and her boyfriend, but they had disappeared somewhere. Jennifer, don't worry so much. I have a big house. You can stay overnight, and I'll drive you back tomorrow. I have to leave today because I have to work tomorrow. I'll have problems if I'm late. My boss granted me just one day off, and he warned me not to be late. Can you please tell me how to get out of your village? Maybe I can take a taxi. Sam grinned. A taxi will be too expensive. We'll find another solution. Unfortunately, I can't drive right now because I've had a few drinks, but I have a good friend here in the village. He won't refuse a small favor. Half an hour later, Jennifer was already in a car racing at top speed. She felt a bit reassured, and throughout the journey, she recalled Sam's words and gestures. He wanted to escort her all the way to the train station, but as a responsible host, Sam couldn't leave his other guests. However, when saying goodbye to Jennifer, he asked for her phone number. Next week, I'll be in your city, and I hope we can meet again, he said. Sam came to town every week, and Jennifer eagerly awaited his visits. From that very first evening, she felt that this meeting was not a coincidence. She wasn't bothered by the significant age difference or the fact that Sam was already married. When he tried to share details about his past, she interrupted him. Sam, your past means nothing to me. I'm more interested in the future, which I can't imagine without you. Jennifer knew she was head over heels in love, but there was no one to confide in because her best friend had once again disappeared from her radar. She found herself pondering the events of the past few months. Of course, among the series of holidays, gatherings, and other significant events, Jennifer's wedding was the brightest. By the conventions of the genre, Natalie was obligated to be happy for her friend and take pride in her direct involvement in Jennifer's destiny. However, for some reason, a lingering sadness and even anger took root in the young woman's heart instead. She felt it for the first time on the first day of the wedding celebration. In the midst of the festivities, a thought crossed her mind. Jennifer is happy, and you'll remain alone. During a dance break, she discreetly whispered to Jennifer, Friend, don't be upset, but I need to leave. I'm not feeling well. Jennifer was very disappointed. Natalie, but the most exciting part is yet to come. Don't go. But Natalie was already rushing to the exit of the restaurant where the celebration was taking place. Natalie, perhaps you'll change your mind. Jennifer called after her. I'll call you tomorrow. I'm going to my parents. Only at the moment of parting did Jennifer remember the main question. Wait, Natalie, why are you alone? We sent you an invitation for two. We broke up with Leonard, Natalie replied, trying to hide her tears as she hurried out of the restaurant where the celebration was taking place. She felt Jennifer's bitter gaze on her back, but instead of expressing gratitude towards her loyal friend, a volcano of hatred erupted inside her. Natalie tried to quell this fiery anger, but all her attempts were in vain, and with each passing day, the hatred and malice grew stronger. To free herself from this oppressive feeling, Natalie stopped calling her friend. She even changed her mobile phone number, but Jennifer, concerned about her disappearance, managed to locate her through her parents. Amanda provided her with a new number. At first, Natalie didn't want to answer the call, but then she changed her mind. Yes, Jennifer, I'm listening, she said. In response, there was an indignant voice. Is that it, Natalie? Don't you want to explain anything? Natalie even managed to muster a smile. 
I've actually decided to embrace a more reclusive lifestyle for a while, so I'm not communicating with anyone or answering calls. Seems like you've taken offense at the whole world. No, dear. I just don't want to interfere with other people's happiness. She didn't wait for Jennifer's response and hung up her phone. But even the short conversation with her friend rekindled less than pleasant emotions in her heart. At first, Natalie was terrified by the uncontrollable anger, but eventually, she grew accustomed to this sharp little ball of negativity that had taken residence somewhere beneath her heart. Her parents started noticing that something was amiss with their daughter, and one day, Amanda couldn't hold back any longer and decided to have a serious conversation with her. Natalie, can you please explain what's going on with you? She had expected different words from her mother, so she immediately locked up. Her response was concise. Mom, is everything okay with me? Lately, I've been thinking a lot about the meaning of life. Amanda was relieved. That's a good sign. If you're thinking like that, it means there's still time to change everything. How can I change it? Well, for example, you could find a job or change your place of residence. All right, and where should I move? To a dormitory. I definitely won't get bored there. Amanda hugged her daughter. She rarely showed affection, so Natalie was surprised. Mom, what's going on with you? The woman laughed. Firstly, I'll try to find you a not-so-dusty but well-paying job. Lawyers are in demand everywhere these days. Secondly, I don't want to jump ahead, but I'll have to. Your father and I decided to give you an apartment. It's small, just two rooms, but it should be more than enough for a young woman. Natalie didn't expect such a generous gift. Joy filled her entire being, and she performed a strange dance in the kitchen from an excess of emotions. The tension disappeared, and both women laughed heartily. The next day, the entire Miller family went to see Natalie's new apartment. Despite the hassles that come with moving, it brought a lot of positivity. For several months, Natalie visited furniture stores, and she hired renowned designers to help create a unique interior for her small apartment. Of course, her parents footed the bill for all of this, but the excitement of having her own place was short-lived, and Natalie began to long for something more. She yearned for new relationships, but it seemed like men had stopped paying attention to her. Natalie analyzed every event, trying to find the cause of this general indifference. After much contemplation, she suddenly had the thought that she might be cursed. When Natalie had almost settled into her new apartment, her mother unexpectedly visited her one bright day. Amanda's eyes sparkled, and her daughter understood that her mother had good news for her. Natalie pressed her for information. Mom, what news have you brought for me? Tell me. They chatted for a bit about the weather and her father's health. Her mother then shared her plans for a bright future when she would retire. Sweetie, I've been offered a job in the administration. Their statistical department has been without a leader for two years. What do you think? Should I accept? Natalie, munching on a pastry, expressed her enthusiasm. Mom, what's there to think about? Of course, you should accept. You won't be able to relax anyway. Besides, the financial aspect is important too. With evident satisfaction, Amanda responded. So, we've come to the main topic on today's agenda. Natalie set aside her treat, asking, Mom, what are you talking about? It's about work, darling or, in this case, your employment. Mom, do we have to discuss it today? When else? Your father and I can't support you forever. You need to earn your own money. Where should I go then? I don't know if you like my offer or not, but I've found a suitable job for you. There's a small firm here that's looking for a lawyer. Not a bad start. What does this firm do? They provide a unique service. They conduct expert assessments of works of art, paintings, dishes, furniture, basically anything of historical value. A light bulb seemed to go off in Natalie's head. She held her breath and remembered that her friend and her husband were professionals in that field. Mom, I agree. Tell me the address of this company and what I need to do. I found this job through an acquaintance, so we'll arrange it through her. Amanda hurried back home, but before leaving, she asked. The owner of this company has the last name Claflin. Does that name ring a bell for you? Natalie even jumped up in excitement. Well, that's Jennifer's husband. What a coincidence. It's a very good coincidence, dear. Jennifer is an honorable person and a great friend. The next day, accompanied by her mother's acquaintance, she arrived at the company's office. 
Sam immediately recognized her. Natalie, what a reunion. I'm genuinely thrilled to see you. And Jennifer will be overjoyed when she finds out. Out of politeness, Natalie inquired, where is she now? At her museum. No, not at all. Remember my country house. Of course, those picturesque surroundings. Jennifer is currently spending time there, you see. We're expecting an addition to the family soon, and she's preparing for this important period. Unpleasant feelings stirred in Natalie's heart again, but she tried not to show it. They chatted briefly about various matters, and Sam invited Natalie to visit. Please do come. My Jennifer gets lonely on her own. Natalie promised, hoping that this conversation would soon be forgotten. In the evening, alone in her apartment, she cried for a long time cursing her fate and the men who didn't want to make her happy. When she had calmed down a bit, she began to plan her actions. Natalie desperately wanted to destroy her friend's family happiness herself, but she didn't know how to do it yet. Her intuition told her that she needed to dig into Sam's past. Perhaps compromising information would surface from there, helping her carry out her plan. Jennifer shivered from the cold and couldn't wait for the bus to arrive at its destination. The window was being pelted by light rain, occasionally mixed with wet snowflakes. She didn't want to think about anything, but thoughts involuntarily returned to the train station platform. The same scene replayed in her mind, Sam, smiling, and the young woman he was holding in his arms. Jennifer had never seen this woman before, but she was eager to find out who she was. However, there was no time for contemplation because Sam took his companion by the hand, and they walked together towards his car. Trying to remain unnoticed, Jennifer got into a taxi. Please, follow that car, she said, pointing at Sam's vehicle. The driver glanced at her curiously. Is your father trying to avoid paying child support? Jennifer noticed the driver's eyes fixated on her protruding belly. Annoyed, she replied, what's it to you? Well, technically, it's none of my business, but there's a but. I need to know the purpose of this pursuit. Maybe you want me to send that gentleman in the car to the other side. Jennifer gave the driver a sideways glance. Do I really look like someone who would do that? Appearances can be deceiving. I have a friend who works in criminal investigations, and he's told me stories. The driver got distracted and missed a green traffic light. Jennifer watched her husband's car receding into the distance. The driver didn't miss the chance to make another comment. The Mercedes is getting away from the chase. Miss, what's the plan? Where should I take you? Jennifer provided the address of Natalie's new apartment. After her friend had landed a job at her husband's company, they had visited her a few times, so Jennifer remembered the way and guided the driver along the most efficient route. You'll reach a fork in the road shortly. Take a left and stop near the shopping center. It's just a hundred meters on foot from there. The driver responded hesitantly. You could make it on your own. It's slippery due to frost tonight. Don't worry, I'll be careful. Contrary to her expectations, Natalie didn't open the door right away. Judging by the noise inside the apartment, it was clear that the homeowner was there. Jennifer had to press the doorbell for about five minutes until a familiar voice finally responded. Who's there? Came the voice. The lock clicked and the door opened slightly. Jennifer, is that you? Why are you out and about in this weather, especially in your condition? And how did your husband allow you to go? I'll call Sam right now and tell him about your antics. Jennifer burst into tears. Natalie, please don't call Sam. He's not in the right state for this. What are you talking about? I saw it with my own eyes. Sam is with another woman, a very young and self-assured one. Of course, I look terrible. I'm ashamed to even be seen on the street, let alone in polite society. Natalie disappeared into the kitchen and returned a few seconds later with a glass of water. Here, drink this. You need to calm down and think about your baby. Jennifer, choking back her tears, drank the water. Yes, you're right, my friend. I need to think about my little one. She sniffled and continued. Why am I so unlucky? Everything was fine between us. Sam never gave me any reason to doubt him. And then all of a sudden, Natalie gently pushed the glass towards her. Why don't you start from the beginning and tell me everything? We can figure out what to do together. Okay, Natalie, just let me calm down a bit. All right, take your time, but then spill the beans. Jennifer caught her breath and, holding a damp handkerchief, began her story. Three days ago, Sam went to the sauna with his friends. 
Is that in the countryside? Yes, it is. That's where all the fancy folks live, so they can afford any whim. Well, they all went there together, and the next day, Sam developed a fever. I called the doctor, did everything as I should. I started taking care of my beloved husband. But yesterday, a letter arrived from home, saying that his father was in critical condition and to come urgently. I was in a panic, didn't know what to do. Sam said I should go alone, that he would handle things himself. So, I rushed to the train station, bought a ticket. Only later did I realize that his mother could have called. Why send a letter when she had a mobile phone in her pocket? Jennifer, overwhelmed by emotions, didn't notice the momentary distortion on her friend's face. Natalie's hands trembled, causing water to spill from the glass Jennifer had given her. Oops, I'm so clumsy, it's dripping on you. Let's dry your pants. I haven't told you everything yet. Jennifer interjected. Go on, I'm listening carefully. In principle, I've told you everything. When I bought the ticket, I had a feeling that something was amiss. I started calling our friends, and they replied. What happened next? Well, that's when you already know what happened. I jumped out of the train. I wanted to return the ticket, but the train on the adjacent platform was leaving, and I could see what was happening on the far tracks. That's when I saw Sam and that girl. Tears streamed down the young woman's face. Natalie, I won't survive such disgrace. You're more experienced in these matters. Tell me, what should I do? After a moment of hesitation, Natalie regained her composure. Let's go to your room first, and then we'll think about it together. But what would you do in my place? Generally, in such circumstances, people don't ask for advice, but I would leave a husband like that. Remember, if a man starts cheating almost immediately after the wedding, what will he be up to in five or ten years? Do you really want to live in constant fear and catch the spiteful looks of rivals? So, you're advising me to break up with Sam? Natalie replied with irritation. I'm not advising you anything. Remember your father's guidance. You have to use your own judgment. It's your decision. Natalie, why are you so angry? I'll just go. Where will you go? I'll go to my parents. I was planning to visit them, but I didn't make it. What about your belongings? How will you travel without them? Jennifer didn't respond. Several hours later, Jennifer deeply regretted traveling such a long distance without any luggage. By evening, the temperature had dropped significantly both outside and inside the train. She hoped to warm up on the bus, but the driver immediately informed the passengers, I apologize, but our heater is broken. You'll have to endure it for a while. Jennifer endured, trying to focus on pleasant thoughts to keep the cold at bay. However, positive memories quickly ran out, and by the end of the journey, Jennifer couldn't feel her feet. The bus was nearly empty when they reached the final stop. The driver watched as she struggled to stand. Miss, let me help you. His offer touched her, but she declined the assistance. Thank you, I'll manage on my own. My feet are just very cold. Do you live far from here? No, it's quite close, about a five minute walk. Thank you, you're very kind. Jennifer stood on the bus station platform and suddenly remembered something. Not long ago, I was admiring the August sunset. My goodness, how long ago that was, and how happy I was back then. Unexpectedly, a familiar voice sounded right next to her. Jennifer, is that you? Paula, it seems we've met again in the same place. Her neighbor circled Jennifer. You're pregnant. Yes. Why did you come without your husband, or did he kick you out? And Paula scrutinized her with curious eyes, and Jennifer didn't know what to say. In her fragile state, any answer would not be in her favor, and she understood this perfectly. Paula, I just decided to visit my parents. I miss them a lot, and my husband is currently very busy. He'll come later for sure. From her neighbor's expression, it was clear that she wasn't satisfied with the response. Why do I need all these details? Let me help you with your bag. Thank you, Aunt Paula. I can manage on my own. It's light. Jennifer headed towards her childhood home on the familiar path. She was afraid to imagine how her presence would affect her parents. But as usual, she was wrong. Her father opened the door for her. Hello, dear. Don't say anything yet. Come in and warm up first. Jennifer entered the spacious room and fell into her mother's arms. Mom, why does this keep happening? I haven't done anything wrong to him. Why did he treat me like this? Woody answered all these questions. You should ask him that. 
He seemed like an honest person from what I saw. I rarely misjudge people, but it seems I made a mistake this time. When everyone had calmed down a bit, Jennifer asked her parents, did it seem like I was coming, or did you actually know? Her parents exchanged glances, and that familiar gesture warmed Jennifer's heart. Natalie called you, didn't she? Yes, yesterday, and here's what I want to tell you, dear. I don't like this. Elizabeth grumbled in disagreement. You always suspect foul play everywhere. Life is like that today. Even close people don't trust each other. That's exactly what I mean. Relatives can betray, and friends even more so. Jennifer sighed heavily. My dear parents, I saw everything with my own eyes. I even tried to follow my unfaithful husband, but the traffic light got in the way. All right, calm down. You're at home now. We'll always help you. Rest, recover, and then we'll see. That evening, Jennifer didn't tell her parents that she wanted to leave the city. She knew her husband would be looking for her, but she had no desire to see him anymore. In the morning, her mother woke her up. Jennifer, Sam is on the phone. He's going crazy. You need to talk to him. Jennifer sat up in bed, rubbed her lower back. No, mom, I can't talk to him right now. Tell him I'll call in a couple of days myself. And please, ask him not to come here, or I'll have to go somewhere again. She overheard her mother talking to her son-in-law on the phone. Despite her parents' initial bias against Sam, mainly due to a significant age difference from Jennifer, things seemed to have improved once they got to know him better. Elizabeth seemed to have convinced Sam not to bother Jennifer for the time being and to give her some space. Sam paced around the apartment. He couldn't fathom what had happened. While he wasn't a saint, he was genuinely perplexed at the moment. So much had changed in him since he started dating Jennifer. Could this be normal for pregnant women? Sam suddenly felt a headache coming on. His temperature was rising again, and the night promised to be restless. He had actually been feeling better lately. If only he hadn't gone out in the freezing weather to the train station yesterday, he might be on his feet today. He had no intention of going anywhere. Jennifer had received some strange letter from home and rushed off. Sam had resigned himself to the fact that he would have to get through this illness on his own. What bothered him most was that he couldn't accompany Jennifer. She was pregnant, and quite far along at that. However, when Jennifer made up her mind about something, she stuck to her decision. This was something he always respected about her. Two hours later, Julie called him. She said she was coming for three days, intending to enroll in a university and take some exams. Of course, he couldn't stay in bed after that. He rarely saw his daughter, which was surprising considering that he had managed to maintain good relations with her despite his ex-wife's staunch opposition to their continued communication. His ex-wife had been vehemently against their meetings. He had always looked forward to their rare encounters. He had last seen Julie about four years ago, and of course, he couldn't refuse her. Life was a strange thing. Leonard, an old friend of theirs, had recently married his ex-wife. They had agreed not to mix friendship and family matters, but occasionally Leonard would tell him how Julie was doing. Sam was grateful for this. He knew that there was no love between his ex-wife and Leonard. Their marriage was more of a convenience for both of them. No matter how hard they tried, their old friendship had faded away completely. He rarely saw his friend now either. His phone vibrated in his pocket. He was surprised to see Natalie calling. Maybe she wanted to explain something about Jennifer. Yes, Natalie. Hello, Sam. Are you at home? Yes, I'm sick. I know. Jennifer told me. Have you seen her? She came to see me before she left. That's why I'm calling you. Can I come over? We need to talk. Sam felt a bit uneasy for a moment. It seemed inappropriate to have female visitors at home when his wife wasn't around. But then he thought that Natalie was Jennifer's best friend, so there was nothing wrong with it. Natalie arrived half an hour later, vibrant, smelling of perfume, lighthearted. Well, where's our patient? I brought vitamins in the form of fruits. I'll wash them, cut them up, and be right back. Sam hesitated. You don't have to, Natalie. What do you mean? You don't have to. If your wife left you in this condition without a care in the world, then someone has to take care of you. He didn't have a chance to respond because Natalie had disappeared into the kitchen. Sam sighed. The only thing he wanted right now was to understand why Jennifer refused to talk to him. Nothing seemed to add up. 
She had left home in the morning to catch a train, but if she had been at Natalie's, it meant she had left later. He was completely confused. However, Natalie didn't seem willing to clarify the situation. Finally, Natalie reappeared, bearing fruit and a pot of tea. Thank you, Natalie, he said and took a sip of tea. Now, tell me what you wanted to talk about. Maybe you know why Jennifer won't talk to me and even forbade me from coming. Well, Natalie began cautiously. I can tell you, but I don't think you'll like it. What kind of hints are these? Sam asked, becoming tense. He was 100% certain of his wife's love for him. What suspicions could there be when she was seven months pregnant? Sam, the thing is, before you, Jennifer was deeply in love with someone else. He left her, and then she met you. It was perfect timing. You helped her heal. But Jennifer never told me about this. We have a very open relationship. Do you think so? Does Jennifer know about your adult daughter? Well, that's entirely different. Jennifer didn't want to know anything about my past life. She said I was important to her only from the moment we met. Natalie looked at him sadly. You answered your own question. The thing is, a few days ago, he showed up again, and Jennifer, she just lost it. No, she didn't go to him, although anything is possible. She just said she needed to figure herself out. Sam jumped up and then immediately sat down. His legs couldn't support him, and an unpleasant weakness washed over his entire body. But that can't be. I'm going to Jennifer right now, and we'll talk about everything. No, you'd better not touch her right now. Besides, where are you going in such a condition? Wait, something doesn't add up. She received a letter. She asked the neighbor to send her that letter herself, so as not to arouse any suspicions. Sam grabbed his head. I need to talk to Jennifer urgently. But his eyelids grew heavy, and within a couple of minutes, he was fast asleep. Natalie smiled. Everything is going according to plan. How fortunate it was that Natalie recently ran into her ex-boyfriend, Leonard. They fondly reminisced about the old times as they hung out at her apartment, while he was still asleep. Natalie quickly took some photos of him. She wasn't sure if they would ever come in handy, but it was better to be safe than sorry, and they did come in handy the next morning. Over breakfast, Leonard casually mentioned that he was married to his ex-wife, Sam, and had a grown-up daughter. Natalie, not quite sure why she needed this information, asked about Jennifer's relationship with their daughter. It was at that moment that Leonard said something that would shape Natalie's future actions. At first, Leonard vehemently refused to help, even raising his voice at her. But when Natalie showed him their intimate photos together, he softened. He didn't want to lose his well-off wife, Sam. Sam had been supporting the woman because she was raising his daughter. From then on, everything followed Natalie's carefully crafted plan. Honestly, even she didn't understand how quickly the plan formed in her mind. But she knew she couldn't afford to lose. Otherwise, she would not only lose out on her gains, but also jeopardize her job and her relationship with her parents, not to mention everything else. The prize in her plan was none other than Sam. Natalie needed him, and not because she suddenly fell in love with him, but because he was even more financially stable than she had ever dreamed. Plus, he was Jennifer's husband, that simpleton who seemed to have everything handed to her. It became an obsessive idea, strip Jennifer of everything and take it all for herself. That way, Natalie could prove that she was superior. And he who laughs last, laughs best. Natalie sighed as she looked at Sam. She knew she would have to work hard. Somehow, he seemed less than her, but she was willing to do whatever it took for her future. Leonard provided her with sleeping pills. She warned him that if Sam woke up before she finished everything, Leonard's wife would immediately find out about his affair. Leonard assured her that Sam would sleep for at least five hours. Well, she didn't need that long. As Natalie prepared the couch, which was not an easy task because Sam was lying on it and then exhaustedly removed his clothes, all she wanted was to collapse and sleep. That was, in fact, her initial plan for the day. Suddenly, Sam's phone vibrated on the table, catching Natalie's attention. Oh, it's Jennifer. She changed her mind pretty quickly. Well, it's what you wished for. She could have remained blissfully ignorant for another day. Natalie remarked with a smirk, declining the call and then using Sam's finger to unlock his phone. Ah, these idiotic modern gadgets. She muttered as she slid beneath the covers. Jennifer, meanwhile, 
was perplexed as she stared at her phone. She had spent the whole day contemplating what to do. She had considered all her options but knew one thing for sure. They needed to talk. After all, Sam had no idea what was happening or why she was behaving this way. Of course, she was a bit hurt that he had listened to her and didn't trust to see her, but he was ill. Perhaps he was really struggling. Jennifer smirked bitterly. Yes, she hadn't even left home, and he was already seeing a young girl. She could practically pass as his daughter. At this point, Jennifer got angry and tried her best not to think about her husband at all, but for some reason, her thoughts revolved around him. By evening, she couldn't take it anymore and decided to call him. They would talk on the phone, and Jennifer would tell him what she had seen. She was curious to hear his explanation. Jennifer was certain that he was waiting for her call. She stared at her phone in bewilderment. What was happening? Did Sam reject her call? That couldn't be, especially since she was pregnant, and he was more worried about her pregnancy than she was. Jennifer cautiously placed the phone on the nightstand. Well, she wouldn't call him again. She realized she wouldn't be able to sleep. She lay down and closed her eyes. Not five minutes later, her phone made a sound. She received a message. This is strange. Maybe it's Sam. She reached out, took the phone, and opened the message. No. Sam was sleeping. He was asleep on the couch in their living room, and female arms and a leg were wrapped around him. The woman's face was not visible, and Jennifer no longer needed to see it. She threw the phone across the room and winced in pain. Oh, it can be. The pain repeated, but this time it was much stronger. It started somewhere in her abdomen, spread across her back, and returned to her abdomen. Jennifer's forehead broke into a sweat. She sat up in bed and called out. Mom. There was silence in response. She called again, and at that moment, the pain returned, the scream so powerful that her parents rushed into the room. Jennifer, Jennifer, what's happening? Jennifer was crying, overwhelmed with fear. Mom, I think my water just broke. How is that possible? You're only seven months pregnant. Woody quickly recovered from the shock. I'll call an ambulance right now, and you get ready quickly, Elizabeth. We'll deal with the rest later. He rushed out of the bedroom with unusual agility, not dropping anything. Elizabeth hurried to help Jennifer get dressed, and they sped through the city with sirens blaring. Jennifer had only one thought on her mind. Seven months, just save her son. Just save him. The doctor, an elderly man, frowned upon examining her. How far along are you? 32 weeks. He muttered something loudly to the nurse, and she immediately brought a gurney. Careful, take your time. You are very lucky you got Philip's shift. Everything will be all right. The nurse reassured her. She was quite young, and her voice was soothing. Jennifer began to slowly regain her composure. She lay down on the gurney, waved to her mom and dad. Her mother looked very pale and said, Everything will be all right. Just have faith. Do you hear me? Jennifer nodded, and tears welled up in her eyes once again. Sam was struggling to wake up. He didn't seem to have a fever but his body ached all over. Maybe it was because of the illness. He suddenly realized he wasn't alone. Well, Jennifer, you are quite the fan of surprises. He mumbled. He opened his eyes, froze for a moment, and then quickly jumped out of bed. Natalie, what are you doing here? He was frantically trying to remember what had happened. They had been talking, then had some tea, and then there was a gap in his memory. Natalie stretched sweetly. Sam, you're not as tender today as you were last night. Well, come here. I never thought you had such a wild side. Sam firmly said, get dressed quickly and leave. The last thing I need is for Jennifer to see you here. Natalie looked at him in surprise. Are you serious? Your wife left you the moment her first love showed up. As for us, things were going quite well. I wouldn't mind repeating it. Sam ran his hand through his hair in frustration. Nothing could have happened between us. Absolutely nothing. I love Jennifer, and I'm not going to, and never intended to, cheat on her. Natalie charmingly smiled. You understand. We all have to find a way out of this situation. I know Jennifer well. She won't forgive either of us. It doesn't particularly matter to me, but you don't have any options left. Sam looked at Natalie intently. Wait a minute. So, you came here specifically for this, to sleep with me. Well, how can I put it? I didn't exactly have the immediate desire to jump into bed with you. 
but I must tell you, I really like you, and Jennifer, with all her principles, doesn't deserve you. Leaving a sick husband for her first love, that's just not right. Sam suddenly smiled. I couldn't figure out why I didn't like you that much, but I tolerated you. Jennifer thought of you as her friend, but you're no friend. You're a real snake, Natalie. Hey, want to watch a movie? Natalie asked in annoyance. What do you mean? More movies. Sam's reaction to everything was somehow wrong. This wasn't part of her plan. Sam stood up, walked to the table, and opened his laptop. You see, Jennifer was right about everything. Everything in its place. It was her idea to equip the whole house with cameras, as she put it. In case we get robbed, we can always see who did it. And also, when the baby is born, it's convenient to keep an eye on him while he sleeps, while we go about our business. So, we're going to see now what you were up to while I was asleep, or we. Oh, Natalie. Natalie remained silent. This wasn't part of her plan at all. Sam watched the video alone. He frowned when he saw Natalie take his phone, and then panicked as he saw her taking photos. He rushed to the phone, checked the missed calls from Jennifer, and when he saw the photo that Natalie had sent to Jennifer, he felt sick. He quickly dressed, simultaneously dialing his wife's number, but the phone kept saying the subscriber was out of the coverage area. Maybe she turned it off, or perhaps she threw away the SIM card. As he got into his car, Sam dialed Elizabeth's number. Sam. He could tell the woman was crying. Sam, what happened to you guys? Sam's hair stood on end. Why are you crying? Where's Jennifer? Jennifer is in the operating room. She started premature labor. Sam was at a loss for words. Then there was some commotion on the line, and Woody's voice came through. If anything happens to Jennifer or the grandchild because of you, I'll be very angry with you. Couldn't you wait until she gave birth instead of enjoying yourself with young mistresses in plain sight? Woody, I don't understand. What mistresses? Jennifer saw you on the platform, and after that, she came to us. It's all because of you. I hope you'll be tormented by guilt. Wait, but she's not a mistress. Did you send Jennifer a letter? Woody became somewhat bewildered. A letter and couldn't I just make a call? Sam firmly stated, I'm leaving. It seems someone really wanted to drive us apart. He directed his car not towards the city exit, but towards his ex-wife's relative's place, where Julie was staying. After a moment of contemplation, he dialed Leonard's number. Hey, sorry for calling so late, but do you have anything to tell me? Probably. Now I have nothing to lose anyway. That wretch sent photos to my wife. Sam had just arrived at the right house when Leonard finished talking. You know, I don't want to have anything to do with you anymore. Your games have gone too far. Jennifer is having premature labor, and she's in some remote hospital. You better pray that everything's okay with them. Jennifer heard a ringing, a really annoying, piercing sound. No, it wasn't ringing. It was more like a whistle. It didn't matter, but her head hurt. Her mouth was dry, and she felt terrible. It's okay, sweetheart, her mother said. Jennifer opened her eyes, realizing she was in a hospital room. It was dim, with some device blinking nearby. Mom. Jennifer raised her hand, placed it on her belly, and looked at her mother in horror. Mom. Don't worry, dear. Just don't get nervous. The baby was born small but healthy. The doctor said they'll keep an eye on him for a couple of days, and then you'll be able to see him. Don't worry. You need to recover. Mom. Is it true? You're not deceiving me. Tears streamed down Jennifer's cheeks. It's true, sweetheart. Get some rest, and I'll stay here with you. Jennifer closed her eyes. Natalie didn't go back to her place. She really didn't want to be alone in her apartment. Instead, she went to her parents' house. Amanda was at home alone. She looked at Natalie attentively and said, Tell me, dear, I understand that something extraordinary has happened. Natalie sat down and burst into tears. Mom, why is it like this? Why do some people get everything? even if they don't deserve it, and others get nothing. I don't understand. Are you talking about someone specific? Yes, Mom, I'm talking about Jennifer. Amanda raised an eyebrow. Do you really think it's unfair that Jennifer got lucky with her husband? That love in their family is unjust. Natalie looked up at her mother. Mom, why don't I have a husband like that? Why don't I have a family? I'm so much better than her. Have you seen her? She's huge, round, waddles like a duck, 
in this Sam. He won't look at anyone but her. Wait, you've seen Sam. Jess, mom, I wanted him to be happy with me. You understand. He just doesn't know what it's like to live with a normal woman, not someone like her. Jennifer is your friend. She's not my friend at all. I hate her, and he should have realized that I'm so much better. Natalie started shouting random words, then continued to speak incoherently, and then started cursing again. Amanda listened to her daughter in fear. She already realized that Natalie had caused trouble. When Natalie began to hysterically laugh, Amanda decisively grabbed the phone and called an ambulance. Sam was driving, and the road wasn't in great condition, especially with the snowstorm beginning. Dad, can you slow down a bit? I understand your wife means a lot to you, but I don't want to die in either. He glanced at Julie, who was gripping the dashboard with both hands, and slightly reduced his speed. Sorry, sweetie. I don't even notice when I start speeding. Julie sighed with relief and settled into her seat more comfortably. You know, it's a strange feeling, realizing that I might have a little brother or sister. Sam gritted his teeth. Maybe, of course, there will be one. Nothing will happen to them. Julie looked at him with curiosity. Dad, what's she like? You're Jennifer. I've seen photos, of course, but what is she really like? Sam smiled. She's wonderful, calm, affectionate, but at the same time fair and doesn't change her decisions. That sounds kind of boring. I agree, it might not sound very exciting, but when you meet her, you'll understand that she's a truly remarkable person. Dad, why didn't you introduce us? Well, I don't even know how to explain it. Jennifer didn't want to know anything about my past. I think she was afraid she'd be jealous, and me. I was afraid that if I introduced you to Jennifer, your mom would forbid us from seeing each other altogether. Julie nodded in agreement. Yeah, that could happen. Oh, look. This is the town we need. Yes, Julie. Jennifer woke up again when it was already dark outside. Winter days are short, so there was no reason to be surprised. In the room, not only her mother, but also her father were present. Sweetie, she's awake, Woody said with a smile. The doctor just left and said that everything is even better than expected. And also, look, he sent me a photo. Woody turned his phone toward Jennifer, and she froze. The photo showed a tiny baby sleeping under a large glass cover. That's my son, Woody said. Exactly, my grandson, Amanda added. Jennifer ran her finger across the screen. Alexander. Suddenly, there was a loud knock at the door, and Jennifer jumped as she heard people arguing in the corridor. Then the door burst open, and Sam practically stormed into the room, followed by the young woman he had been hugging on the platform. Jennifer. He rushed to her fell to his knees beside the bed and began kissing her hands. Jennifer, how can this be? How are you? What about our son? Jennifer carefully withdrew her hand from him. Our son is fine, but may I ask why you brought her here? Sam stood up and Julie looked frightened. Woody glared at her and even Elizabeth's gaze was far from welcoming. I brought her here because it's about time you all met. This is my daughter from my first marriage, Julie. We should have introduced you a long time ago then all of this might not have happened. Jennifer looked at him in surprise. Your daughter. Then she looked bewilderedly at her parents, who now didn't know how to act. Julie stepped forward, trying to smile. I congratulate you, and it feels very strange to me that I now have a little brother. Jennifer shook her head. Julie, I'm sorry, but... She turned to Sam. You understand that this isn't all, don't you? I do, he replied seriously. It's my fault for trusting people more than they deserved, or rather, trusting only one person your friend. She came to me yesterday, said she wanted to talk about you. Of course, at that moment, I didn't understand anything and agreed. Everything that happened next, you can see for yourself. I'll send you the camera footage, but I can tell you right away that there was nothing like what you might have thought. Jennifer was tired. She was very tired, but she wanted to get to the bottom of everything. I don't understand, but how is Natalie involved in all of this? He rushed to her, fell to his knees before the bed, and began kissing her hands. Jennifer, how can this be? How are you? What about our son? Jennifer carefully withdrew her hand from him. Our son is fine, but may I ask why you brought her here? Sam stood up, and Julie looked frightened. Woody glared at her, and even Elizabeth's gaze was far from welcoming. I brought her here because it's about time you all met. 
This is my daughter from my first marriage, Julie. We should have introduced you a long time ago. Then all of this might not have happened. Jennifer looked at him in surprise. Your daughter. Then she looked bewilderedly at her parents, who now didn't know how to act. Julie stepped forward, trying to smile. I congratulate you, and it feels very strange to me that I now have a little brother. Jennifer shook her head. Julie, I'm sorry, but... She turned to Sam. You understand that this isn't all, don't you? I do, he replied seriously. It's my fault for trusting people more than they deserved, or rather, trusting only one person your friend. She came to me yesterday, said she wanted to talk about you. Of course, at that moment, I didn't understand anything and agreed. Everything that happened next, you can see for yourself. I'll send you the camera footage, but I can tell you right away that there was nothing like what you might have thought. Jennifer was tired. She was very tired, but she wanted to get to the bottom of everything. I don't understand, but how is Natalie involved in all of this? Leonard told me that Natalie decided that she could handle my wife's responsibilities better than you. She deserves credit for her plan. She even took the trouble to come here to send a letter from you. Elizabeth suddenly spoke up, so I wasn't wrong. I saw Natalie a few days ago, met her, but she pretended not to recognize me, so I thought I was mistaken. Sam, what's going on with you? You almost lost your child. What kind of games are these? He pressed a finger to his lips, and Elizabeth shifted her gaze to Jennifer, who was sleeping. She slept and smiled in her sleep. Sam whispered, let's not talk about it in the ward. Three hours later, when Julie was already asleep, Sam and Jennifer's parents sat in the kitchen. Sam told them everything he knew. Finally, Woody said, so essentially, you're not to blame for anything. Fate threw a test at you, but Jennifer is smart, and I'm sure she'll think it over and forgive you. Sam couldn't sleep for a long time, and when he was dozing off, he received a message from Leonard. Take care of Julie taking your wife to the sea to apologize. Turns out she means more to me than I thought. Another message arrived immediately after. Natalie's mother had sent her for treatment as she had psychological disorders. Sam put his phone aside, closed his eyes, and smiled. My little one, my dear one. Jennifer looked at the tiny face and couldn't hold back her tears. Less than half an hour ago, her son had been brought to her. The doctor had said, well done, young man. No difficulties could break you. I hear he's going to be named Alexander. Jennifer nodded, not taking her eyes off her son's face. The doctor chuckled. Welcome to this world. He left the room, and just ten minutes later, the door opened quietly again. Sam was standing in the doorway, eagerly looking at the bundle in his wife's arms. Jennifer, may I? Jennifer, without raising her head, said, And here comes our dad. Don't be mad at him. He's, of course, to blame, but not that much. But thanks to him, we got to meet a little earlier. Jennifer looked at her husband. Why are you frozen there? Come and meet him. Sam quietly sat on the edge of the bed. Jennifer, forgive me, I'm an idiot. Later. Let's not talk about it now. Look at how tiny his little hands are. Sam reached out. May I? I'll be careful. Sam held his son in his arms realizing that he was not just a husband anymore, but responsible for his beloved wife and this very tiny and very dear human being. Jennifer was surprised to see her husband crying. Sam, what's wrong? He looked at her. You know, I used to think that love has limits, and now I understand that there can't be any limits. I love you both so much that it hurts in my chest. I'll do everything so that you never have to worry about anything. Just please, believe in me. Jennifer nodded. I believe in you, Sam. And now, give Alexander back to me. He should eat soon. Sam understood that he had never seen anything more beautiful in his life than how his son was eating. Yes, his eyes were stinging, and he wanted to cry, but he was afraid of missing a single moment. 